be an even more just in time processing mode today. Um, so I'm going to talk about Inkits, Inquiry Intelligent Tutoring System, and Ink Blotter, which are tools for students and teachers, uh, respectively. And this is an assessment and tutoring environment for science inquiry, and we've heard a lot about NGSS. So I'll say a little bit about myself. Um, I don't know why I'm tagged there, but anyway. <laughs> um, this is my family. Um, so my kids, uh, I had a baby in graduate school who's now 26. This is Adrian. And I uh, finished up my PhD as a single mother uh, working in another country. Um, not an easy thing to do, by the way. Um, so she's 26. Adam is 21. He's a bit of a disenfranchised learner working on his skateboarding and not, not in college. Um, you can tell I'm really happy about that. And uh, my daughter Alexa is with us here in Montclair High School. She just started last week in high school. She's 16. And my husband Neil is a physicist and an inventor. He has his own company working on uh, early detection of cancer and several worldwide patents, like 10 worldwide patents. Uh, brilliant guy. Um, and these are my dogs, Lucy and Mickey, who I refer to from time to time. So this is my, this is my family, so when I'm not here, I'm with uh, some subset of these people. And uh, I'd like to tell you about my team. Uh, currently, it's, um, <coughs> this team, this project started in 2007. So there's, uh, the team has expanded and, and uh, kind of changed some members uh, over time. We have Charity Stoudenrouse, who's a former teacher from Oregon, who started using our products and liked them so much, she actually became a full-time full um, employee. She's a consultant for uh, a company that my grad students and I started, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, Mike Brigham is employed by uh, Rutgers, but he works remotely. Mike was a student with me, and he's a full-time um, he's a full-time developer, application developer, and he works along with Victor, who's there, who's the question mark, but the man, the masked man, is there. You see Victor here. So Victor and Mike Brigham work closely together. Um, you have Rachel, who's a new graduate student on the project. She started this summer, and she's doing fantastic work. Uh, you have Hai Ying Lee, who's a postdoc. Where's Hai Ying? Oh, there's Hai Ying. Hai Ying comes uh, to us from Art Gracer's lab, uh, doing natural language processing, which we're now doing on uh, this project. Um, we have Raha Musavi, who some of you have met. She's a PhD student finishing at WPI because she was far enough along that transferring didn't make sense. Uh, Pat Rowan is a graphic designer who works on the project. And then we have uh, Cam Betts and Mike Sao Pedro, who are two former graduate students, and um, they co-founded a company called Apprentice. And these products are being productized and commercialized through um, Apprentice. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, here's my framework for today, the rationale and brief theoretical framework for Inkit's design, technology development, and research. We're a deep technology group. So we do artificial intelligence work and work at very much at the intersection of um, learning sciences and computer science. I used to be at WPI, which is a really, really good tech school outside Boston. Um, you know, it's rated in the top 60 universities in the country, but like in the top handful of uh, engineering schools, actually. And I started a learning sciences and technologies program. So many of these students came with this really incredible tech background, and so that's why we've kind of evolved the way that we've evolved. Um, oops, of course that has to happen, right? All right. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the methods and the studies leading up to the current Inkits platform. And uh, the point that I really want to drill down on is that technological advances afford us development that we weren't able to do before and a, a lens on students learning and teachers assessment and instructional processes that we weren't able to do before. And so we're really trying to push the envelope on developing rigorous, scalable technological solutions to support teachers and students. And then some drill downs with some empirical findings. But this is sort of a broad versus a deep, um, deep conversation. So um, as you all know, the U.S. continues to face a STEM crisis. We were 21st in STEM in the last uh, PISA. Um, you know, 21st, people are often very surprised when they hear that. They think the U.S. should be in the top. We're, we're not anywhere near the top, right? Um, so you have Finland, that's a consistent high score. 
Hong Kong, Singapore, you even have Canada. I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm Canadian. Come on, guys. Um, so in response, we have the next generation science standards. Uh, that call for the development of authentic science materials that richly integrate the content with the inquiry, right? Because you can't really teach the inquiry separate from the content, and you can't really teach the content separate from the means by which we know. In science, the means by which we know something is really the sort of the ontological uniqueness of the domain, right? So that's why the NGSS practices are so deeply important. But how do we support students and teachers in NGSS? It's really complicated. A lot of people are working on this problem. Many people in this room are working on this problem. And we interviewed uh, um, just hundreds of teachers, by the way. In fact, I interviewed a teacher this morning um, and asked them how, how they're doing with implementing NGSS. And so in some states, like in Massachusetts, where I had a phone interview this morning, they have you know 26 kids in a class, right? In Massachusetts, where you have a lot of support for education, you have a lot of social capital, etc. Yeah, I don't know why this keeps happening. It's just the wireless. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, you know, she said, yes, I have some trouble implementing it. I need help assessing. I have some trouble implementing it. But this is nothing compared to teachers will be talking who are in California when, you know, they have 40 kids in a class and half the kids are working in their second language. Uh, we're doing a lot of work in Oregon right now. Oregon has 50 kids in a classroom. 50 kids in a classroom. Okay, even in kindergarten, by the way. How is a teacher going to assess NGSS when students are doing hands-on inquiry in science and come up with rigorous, objective uh, benchmarks for students and then use those to inform instruction in science? I mean, this is a near impossible job. So in states that are leading uh, the competency-based uh, movement, which, you know, New Jersey is one of these, uh, New Hampshire is another one, um, New Hampshire teachers are leaving the field in droves. I mean, they're just like, you know, my life, <laughs> my life is being taken over by trying to assess students' competencies. In California, this is a really big problem as well. We interviewed teachers who said they spend their entire weekend grading labs that students have done their entire weekend. I really feel like this is uh, terrible for our field. Um, so again, I'm gonna remind you that what our goal is is to develop technology-based materials that can scale, that teachers can use in real time. All right, so why are we falling behind? Step back, why are we falling behind? I don't have to, I'm preaching to the converted here, but schools are modeled after factories, right? Using a one-size-fits-all approach. <coughs> Our, currently, our current factory model has led to this Swiss cheese problem, right? Hence our PISA scores. And then there's the assessment problem, right? This is the really big problem that we've been working on since 2007. What does Johnny know? So you have your school business as usual model where you have a, a state assessment or a school assessment that uses rote knowledge of facts or formulas and from the skill assessment is very limited. Th that's a generous statement. I mean, it's non-existent. Educators can't know who needs help. Feedback is given too late to be formative. So even in Massachusetts, the MCAS scores come in in August, well, from the prior year. I mean, it's totally useless, right? Um, and many students struggle in silence, right? That's, that's wrong. We have the technological capacities to, to support teachers in real-time support, students in real-time, and we should be leveraging those. Again, what's driving this need is that the NGSS has been adopted by 17 plus, uh, states plus DC, and another, uh, I think, another 15 or so have expressed interest or are adapting, right? And this is driving the need for new materials for assessment. But every year, students are graduating lacking critical skills. So this is a, an academic problem, but it's a far bigger problem than just an academic problem. Because every year, you have students <coughs> leaving, hating science, not going into STEM disciplines, and, and really hating every minute of it, right? and not learning the basic skills. The other part of this opportunity is that online and hybrid models are gaining adoption. So I interviewed a teacher last week um, from California, and this is a middle school that's 50% uh, time in a brick and mortar school, 50% time the kids are at home. 
this is really interesting. I mean, it's a parenting nightmare, by the way, but <laughs> from a pedagogical point of view, it's really interesting when you think about how are you going to design tech that's going to support what the teacher's doing in the classroom, and then the kids can work on activities at home that are feeding into that, right? I mean, these models are coming. They're, they're alive and, and developing, and we really need to better understand them and design for them. So my, my pitch here is that the time is now. So um, methodological advances like computational techniques can be transformative for teachers' experiences and for students' experiences. And we have a lot of data about that. And they need to be leveraged to design better ways to support teachers' assessment and instructional processes <coughs> and also students' learning of science. And so that's really what I've spent you know, the last eight years doing. This project that started in 2007 has been um, working towards that goal. All right, so what we want to do is support teachers in their daily instruction of NGSS and their assessment of NGSS. Because as it gets rolled out, teachers are going to have to produce metrics, benchmark metrics, of what students know in terms of these very rich competencies. And they're not trivial at all. And we want to support students. And again, so what we want to create is rigorous, scalable, technology-based tools for teachers and students that are theoretically driven, right? <coughs> okay, this thing is gonna drive me crazy. Should I shut the wireless off? Oh, good. Okay, good. just give me one second here. Because my... Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So our solution to this problem is INCIT's Inquiry Intelligent Tutoring System. It's an assessment environment. Okay, remember that it's an assessment environment uh, for middle school physical life and earth science using micro worlds. So Seymour Papert, uh, who died recently, if, if people don't know that, um, started that, uh, coined that term, it's synonymous with simulations. Um, these assessments are implemented during the content unit to provide formative data for teachers to do class-driven instruction and help individuals in real time. Okay, so the, basically the teacher might be doing a unit on density and then, you know, halfway through drop in, do a, a one-day activity, like one class period or two class period activity in INCITS, assign it for homework, something like that, get the data and then reposition what they're doing in the, the unit, right? That's what they're designed for. The assessment and alerting, alerting is our newest thing, uh, that's done in real time so the teacher can actually stop the class, go, hey, wait a second, too many of you are not testing your hypothesis mm -hmm. because we're logging everything the students are doing. I'm going to tell you more about that in a second. Then also tutoring via Rex, who's our uh, pedagogical agent, is done in real time. And these are all driven by patented algorithms. So um, we're the first group actually in the world to use data mining and machine learning in this way. And um, we're um, under review for our fourth patent. So here's our performance assessment model. You have your student who's um, working here. That's a lab that he's imagining in his mind, but he's working virtually. The virtual lab, we're tracking everything they do, every mouse click. So every time on task, every mouse click, every input, everything they write, absolutely everything. And we distill that down to create reports and alerts based on data mining techniques, and we feed that data back to the teacher. This is an example of what our report looks like. So these are designed by Cam Betts, who's a human computer interaction designer. So it's very salient what the teacher needs to know. So you can see here hypothesis formation, right? Uh, identifying the independent variable, the dependent variable, the relationship between them. The teacher can say, gee, uh, you know, 12 of my students are having problems. Do I want to stop the class now or do I want to just target those kids? Do I want Rex to get them? What do I want to do, right? So she can make that decision in real time as she's watching this report. She can drill down and see who are those kids who need help. Our alerts is more a more sophisticated <coughs> system, actually, is a very, very cool little thing. So it says here, John Marcone's having trouble with hypothesizing. He's struggling because he doesn't know the difference between the independent and dependent variable. Teacher can see the history of what that student's done for the day, can walk over and help John. When it's resolved, she can click as resolved and go on to the next person who's waiting. 
she's experimenting. But if, say, Vicky was changing too many variables at once, and she subsequently, while the teacher was helping John, she's figured out how to do it, she can actually, her name will disappear automatically. And by the way, you can um, order these alerts in different ways. So right now, they're sort of as they occur. This is a screenshot of that. You could order them, show me everybody who's having trouble with hypothesizing. Show me everyone. And the teacher then gains a lot of information about what's happening with that inquiry practice, right? So that's really cool. Teachers, by the way, love this thing, especially in Oregon. They can't live without this thing. They love this thing. In fact, we had a bunch of research schools there, and we did a pilot with this. And they were like, oh, we just want to do this little pilot. Now you have to go back to not using blotter. And they're like, no way. <laughs> it's blotter or nothing. They really like this. Because it affects their instruction in real ways, right? And they can stop the class in real time when, when uh, helping students is most effective. So that's another example of our alerts. Um, all right, here's Rex, our pedagogical agent. So we have a fairly rich scaffolding um, um, plan or um, system that comes up and they offer different kinds of supports. So we start with an orienting support where the student may not know and we use Tan Ta Ji work on uh, that informed this where students often forget where they are so we orient them. Hey this is where you are right and then we might give a conceptual hint like you're changing too many variables at once how will you know about the effects of x on y right that's a conceptual hint. Then if the student still doesn't get it, we might give a deeper sort of procedural hint. You really need to target your independent variable, right? And then if they still don't get it, we give an instrumental hit, hint. But Rex is only triggered when the system detects that the student needs it. That's not on-demand help because students don't know when they need help. So with our uh, inkits and our simulations, we address how to assess students' inquiry practices and so this is performance assessment using micro worlds. It involves analyzing log files. Log files, I love log files. I love log files. I can't tell you how much I love log files. So my entire career I've spent drawing protocols, think aloud protocols, uh, problem solving protocols, log files. I mean, I love basically being in the mind of the user. And we pair that with educational data mining. And then we're working on how to scaffold students' inquiry with microworlds. And this involves pedagogical and methodological issues of how to determine when to jump in, right? But when you have a really rich corpus of data, which we have now, you know, 70,000, you know, 70,000 users or something like that, you can actually machine learn, well, if they're here and it's a little fuzzy, can we let them go or can we not? What's the likelihood they're going to get where we want them to go? I mean, we know that, right? So we know if we can let them kind of flounder or when we have to jump in on them. And that might change for a certain user too. So what have we done? So we've developed 18 um, simulations for middle school aligned to Massachusetts and now NGSS. And these variables are based on students' uh, misconceptions in the science domain that they're working in. So we want them to richly engage in inquiry around the misconceptions that they have. And then we pilot and refine these with think alouds of individual students and teachers. And I have a book chapter coming out in, in uh, Andre Rep's new book uh, on this process. But basically, we started with kids uh, doing hands-on inquiry with a physical uh, apparatus, a ramp. And we had kids from a Worcester after-school program of at-risk kids, for at-risk kids, come to the lab, and we worked with them one-on-one. -on -one. And that's how we developed every micro world, every task, every prompt, every scaffold, absolutely everything about our, about our system was developed in this way. And then what we developed are these widgets to support inquiry. So these both elicit and capture student performance using evidence-centered design. So I don't know how many people know about evidence-centered design, but it's a really interesting framework for thinking about what is the competency you want to measure? And then how do you design to get at that? And then there's several, I mean, evidence-centered design has gotten very deep. but So we use evidence-centered design in our book chapters about that. And then these performance assessments, reports, and alerts on inquiry skills required breaking these ill-defined inquiry skills into a very, very fine-grained sub-skills because we have to distill out of the log files what corresponds to 
inquiry performance in these subskills, right? So that's not a trivial thing. And you know, I'm, I'm sure there are people who might say, well, I disagree with your subskills. Well, you know, we had to put the, we had to, somebody had to lay something down. We laid something down and it works pretty well. And they're actionable for the teacher and actionable for the student. And to me, that's really, I think, what has to inform the system. Because if you're giving teachers data that's far too granular for what they need to influence their instruction, it's not useful to them. But if you tell them they um, are not testing their hypothesis, they can't construct a hypothesis because they really don't know what an independent variable is, the teacher goes, oh, I can do something with that. I can have a conversation with my class about what in an independent variable is, right? I had a conversation with a teacher, um, superstar teacher who's been teaching for 29 years, uh, two weeks ago, and she said, I had no idea what my student didn't know. I was shocked. I was shocked. She said, I thought they knew how to design a controlled experiment. And then when they're analyzing their data, she goes, I realized that many of them are dealing with confounded data. So the errors in data interpretation are due to the fact that the data is buggy to begin with, right? So you have to stop them in real time in order to correct for the, the fine grain problems that they're having with that inquiry performance before they can go on, right? So for every subskill, for every skill, we have these subskills underlying it. Some of them are very rich. Some of them, there's like eight subskills, like data interpretation, which is a very hard task. I'm sure Clark and Reed are like, oh yeah, it's very hard for students to interpret their data. And we can catch when they engage in confirmation bias. It's really, really fun. But anyway, so we have uh, data mining rules and we have uh, KE, knowledge engineering rules. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. But why do we do this with simulations? So simulations permit authentic science inquiry and assessment, right? Because it's like the real thing and it leverages from the perceptual affordances of being like the real thing, right? So I'm sure you've all read Donald Norman and uh, leveraging from these perceptual affordances I believe is a really important thing with respect to authentic inquiry. But Don Norman, unlike J.J. Gibson, where the word affordance was developed, so J.J. Gibson was a perceptual psychologist, who you probably remember, and he talked about an affordance as a, a function of the thing, the object. But then Don Norman came along and said, no, no, it's only a function of the object if the user has the right skills, knowledge, predispositions, habits of mind, etc., to leverage what the system has, right? So when you think about the unit of analysis, it's really what the student is bringing to bear on the information given. So it's a much richer notion of affordance, right? So I want to I want to tell you about that because this sort of this is this sort of visual information processing aspect of my work is very near and dear to my heart. Um, so with simulations, students can develop a hypothesis or ask a question. <coughs> they use models to plan and carry out investigations. They analyze and interpret their data. They warrant their claims. They construct uh, explanations and they argue from evidence. So these are, you know, um, NGSS 2013 frameworks. So they provide these assessment and scaffolding potential because they're authentic, much more authentic and valid than multiple choice tests. I never get an argument with anybody there. But they're currently not used for the skills they were designed to foster which is really, you know, kind of backward, right, for lack of a better word. So this system, right, the kid is working in this system, we can generate these rich log files and we can use those for performance assessment. And that's really what we've done. And Andre Rupp calls these work products. So they're kind of work products. And, you know, he's German, so I think a lot of people don't like that word, work product. It's too um, behavioristic. But he uses it and I think it still has meaning. But you can leverage these log files to get at their work products and their work processes. And you can see when a student is grappling with something, right? They're toggle, 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 toggle. Okay, now I made a decision, right? It's very interesting to think, why did they make that decision? That's their work product. That's what they've decided, right? I'm going to construct, I'm going to test these variables. Like, oh, right? And we actually can see where their eyes are, too. It's like really cool. Um, and we can give immediate feedback, blending learning and assessment, which is really where the field needs to go.
But there's challenges. It's not like, oh, okay, so you, you know, get some log files, you do data, data mining, and Bob's your uncle, right? Everybody's happy. It's way more complicated than that because there's an entire field, you know, uh, down the road at ETS called psychometrics, right? Which is alive and well, and um, it's a, it's sort of counter to that approach because it's not a traditional psychometric approach. So what are the challenges? Well, complex tasks take longer, mm -hmm. and so you have fewer measures of one type. So Shabelson would say this is reduced reliability. There's also, this is really where the rubber meets the road, and sort of the uniqueness of science, is that there's more than one way to conduct inquiry, both correctly and incorrectly. There's a myriad of ways in which students can do this correctly, and there's a myriad of ways in which they can do it incorrectly. Well, the beauty of machine learning is over thousands and thousands and thousands of examples, it can start to recognize those patterns, right? That's why you couldn't just use knowledge engineering, by the way, for something like this. You have to use a combination of knowledge engineering and data mining. And these tasks are not independent. So once a student makes a hypothesis, all their inquiry is grounded to that hypothesis, right? Well, now Johnny and Julie are doing different tasks. And maybe Johnny is doing a harder task, but you need to come up with an equivalent metric because your job is a teacher, right? Um, and also, traditional measurement methods can't apply because there's changing skill levels as students are working within the environment. That's true in psychometrics as well, but it's easier to do in psychometrics. We use BKT, Bayesian Knowledge Tracing, to handle this. And then there's theory, and this is where I think we've done some really nice work. Theory needed to both distill and aggregate the data. Because raw mouse clicks are useful to no one, right? They need to be distilled up and aggregated up at a level that's meaningful and actionable to the teacher and to the student and to the researcher, etc. And I think that's where our, our contribution is, and then embodying that. So we use evidence-centered design. I won't go into too much literature here, but um, this involved operationalizing for scalability and auto scoring and the task model and the evidence model and all the pieces and how the BKT works together. And I have a paper in um, Journal of Educational Data Mining that goes into lots and lots of detail if you're interested in that. So the pedagogical design of INCITS, um, we strike a balance between direct versus discovery approaches. And our colleagues, Ravit and Clark, have written very nicely about this. I cite this paper all the time. So there was this big debate between Paul Kirchner and um, you know Rutgers, uh, <laughs> Rutgers people about direct versus uh, discovery. And uh, what I like to title this slide is the good, the bad, and the ugly, because if discovery is too open-ended, students really grapple with it. Right. So this is Seymour Papert's great dream, but you know Seymour Seymour Papert, you know rest in peace, was not a cognitive scientist. You know he was a mathematician. And to him, you know, he didn't have a theory of cognition, and I don't think he wanted one, right? Um, but children struggle with monitoring what they do. Um, they can become lost and frustrated, and their confusion can lead to misconceptions. And teachers spend considerable time scaffolding students' content and procedural skills, right? Teachers are pulling their hair out. They are leaving the field in droves. I'm not kidding you. Now, drilling down on some of these individual skills, like hypothesizing, they have trouble even forming a hypothesis, right? Mostly because they don't know what an independent variable is and choosing which variables to work with. And uh, Clark has done some work there. Um, they may not know even what a hypothesis is. They don't know what the epistemic form of a hypothesis is. And they avoid stating hypotheses that could be rejected, right? So this is uh, Learning Science's review of this um, literature. Now, with regard to designing and con constructing um, experiments, conducting experiments, they may not test their articulated hypotheses. They don't gather sufficient evidence to test their hypotheses. They change too many variables at once. That's classic, control for variables. And they run experiments that are enjoyable to watch instead of testing their hypotheses, right? So there's myriads of, 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 uh, of, liter of literature studies, research studies in this, uh, in this area. So the thing is, is that if students engage in this when they're doing inquiry, their data interpretation is all buggy, right? So how is the teacher supposed to provide a, a, a valid metric of students' skills at, um, 
at interpreting their data when the d data is all buggy, right? Well, you need a system that captures that in real time. Or you need to be able to inform the teacher in real time that this is what's going on so she can stop the class and go, hey, hey, wait a second, wait a second. You guys are changing all these variables, right? Or you're not even testing the hypothesis you were supposed to test. So in data interpretation, you know, this is an area where uh, both Clark and Ravid have done a lot of work. It's an incredibly rich, incredibly uh, fun area to work in, but it's a really thorny problem. They can't link their data to their hypotheses, or they tend not to. They may draw conclusions based on confounded data. They change ideas about causality over and over. They don't relate outcomes of experiments to the theories being tested. Uh, they may rely on theoretical arguments rather than their experimental evidence. And then they engage in confirmation bias. Everybody knows what confirmation bias is, right? And we actually can capture confirmation bias in real time where the student makes a hypothesis that's scientifically inaccurate. They have the data to actually, you know, refute their hypothesis. They have it. It's sitting there. And they go back to their original hypothesis. Happens over and over and over again. Why? I am not sure. But uh, they do it, and Raha Musavi's PhD is about that. So we capture that in real time, and we can intervene in real time. Now, the benefits of these computational techniques are the, these are high fidelity, high fidelity data, right? The highest fidelity data we're going to get for probably a very long time, maybe, maybe forever, I don't know. Uh, in virtual environments, they're collected over hundreds of users, often in disparate locations. So this is a scalable, scalable uh, solution. And then you have computational techniques that offer this analytic um, leverage on these learning processes, not just their products, at scale. Right? So neither of these things were, were possible before, and this greatly benefits teachers and students. And that's, that's why I get out of bed in the morning. So um, you could do this a couple of different ways, and people have tried to do this a couple of different ways. You could do knowledge engineering from theory, and I've actually done that, and it'll work in some instances, but mostly very well defined. You can do knowledge engineering for domains in which there are clear answers, like 2 plus 3 equals 4. No, 2 plus 3 does not equal 4, it equals 5. You don't need AI to do that level of mathematical um, uh, analysis of your data, right? You just need a math engine under the hood. But science is not like that, right? Science, there's a myriad of ways in which they can do things correctly, a myriad of ways in which they can do things incorrectly. And then you can use the second approach is machine learning or educational data mining, which you're using is both top down and bottom up, right? So it's not unsupervised. When people talk about machine learning and you hear a lot about big data and criticisms about big data, what they're talking about is unsupervised. You basically like regression, garbage in, garbage out, right? I'm not talking about that. Nobody's talking here about, you know, just throwing the log files in there, shaking it up, and see what you get. Nobody's talking about that. We use learning sciences theory to deeply understand where students were doing things correctly and not, not correctly. And then we do what is, is like a, what's called text replay tagging, like protocol analysis over hundreds and hundreds of cases. And then we machine learn up the models to match those human scores. It's a, it's a very graying experience. Um, so knowledge engineering, the, te the, the human rights rules of what it means to demonstrate skill. So Kevin McElhaney and Marsha Lynn have done this, right? But it's very top down. And um, it only works where you have students Save for design of controlled experiments, right? CVS, mm -hmm. which is where this has been done yeah, for by a lot of people. What people who do knowledge engineer engineering they do is they say, okay, if a student does trial one and trial two can be reliably and validly compared to trial two, to trial one, right? So they changed variable A in trial one and then they tweaked variable A in trial two. I'm going to take that as demonstration of how of skill that they know how to conduct controlled trials. I too would agree that that's most likely, if they can consistently do that, and if I were doing it, that's how I would do it. Most of us would do it like that, okay? But students don't do that. They get into an environment like this, and they're clicking, and they're running different things, and what if I do this, and what if I do that? 
you are not in the mind of the student, so you do not know if they know the skill. Only, you can only know that if they do sequential trials. You can make a reasonable inference. So what a lot of people who've done knowledge engineering or knowledge engineering style coding schemes, even if it's human, like uh, McElhaney, like uh, David Clark, like Deanna Kuhn, what they've done is they've done all take trial two and compare it to trial one. And what some people do, like uh, Christian Shun has done this, mm -hmm. I'll take trial one and I'll take any other trial trial 45. And if trial 45 could be compared to trial 1 where they varied variable A in trial 1 and they varied variable A in trial 45, I'm going to take it as evidence of the student knowing how to control for trials. Right? You're not in the mind of the kid. You don't know. That could be random. It's 45 trials later. Our system does not rely on sequential trials to know whether a student knows how to conduct uh, controlled trials. Because based on tens of thousands of cases, we can reliably say, looking at this pattern, we're going to say, yes, the kid knows the skill, or no, the kid doesn't know the skill, right? Or if we think they don't know the skill, or right on the, on the an edge case, Rex can jump in, give the kid a scaffold, and say, we're a little unsure. Run two more trials and prove to me that you know how to do this. So what knowledge engineering does then is takes this very top-down approach, traces the student processes, but as I said, there's many ways in which students can engage in inquiry. And the experimental manipulation is one very deep, very rich example. So machine learning is what you do is, um, you hope that your slides don't uh, drop words off them. But anyway, um, what you do is you do, um, you develop categories for coding. You code these log files, like text, they're called text replay tags. It's like protocol analysis of log files. And then you, you decide what are the canonical set of behaviors, the presence and absence of, the number of, et cetera. And then you train those, train using machine learning, you train it up to recognize those patterns. And the end product is a model that recognizes the skill. And then can compare this using kids who are not used to build the model, right? All right. So uh, I've said a lot about the two of these things, but really the, the, the big difference is that machine learning is top down and bottom up. It's much more rich and it's much more nuanced. And it can detect if a system is on the cut, if a person is on the cusp, right? If, if it's not sure, all right? So um, it's, it's less intuitive, but maybe less subject to an expert blind spot when you use data mining. The metrics are more difficult in the edge cases. Uh, CVS can be assessed without sequential trials, that's what I told you, can be tested for validity in other topics, so you could use your rules and see in another domain with one IV and one DV, do these metrics work? And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Knowledge engineering has all these limits, most of which it's either too stringent or too lenient an assessment, right? And then from the point of view of real-time feedback, if the student has collected all that data and you assume they know the skill and they don't and they move on to data interpretation and their data is all confounded, that's problematic, right? So there's a lost learning opportunities, lost assessment opportunities. And by the way, application of these rules to other domains cannot be done because they're domain specific. So there's lots of reasons why we have to move away from knowledge engineering. So here's an example of our, um, of our um, tool. This is phase change, one of my favorites. Determine how the amount of ice affects the, the melting point or the boiling point, for example. Now, there's a classic misconception that middle schoolers have that if you have more of a substance, the boiling point is higher. Classic misconception, right? So we want them to investigate deeply that question. So uh, we have determine how the amount of ice affects the ice's melting point, and then they use these widgets here for a hypothesis, which is really useful for ELLs because ELLs are really, really sensitive about their writing skills, and some of them don't know, many students, not, e not just ELLs, don't know what is the epistemic form of a hypothesis. So we use these widgets to gather that information. And then once they've created their hypothesis, they go on to a micro world, and then here are the variables that they are varying, right? These are our independent variables that we've selected according to the misconceptions of the domain, right? There's a physics engine under the hood, right? So it, this is not a um, flash simulation. This is a real 
this is not an animation. This is a real simulation acting in accordance with laws of physics. So basically, they vary the variables, they hit the run button, and everything is populated in real time. Then they hit the re add to results button, so they can run a whole bunch of trials. And then what they do is their data is populated into a table because students are very poor at tabling data. In fact, we did a whole study where they, in fact, could not put data into a table. And we just kept giving them more and more support. Imagine there's two columns. Okay, now how are you going to do it? Could not do it. And we're not measuring their data literacy, right? We're not measuring that. That's a different competency. So all their data gets tabled like this. And then what they have to do is they have to, using a widget, do an analysis uh, using a widget. And they have to select the trials that warrant or refute their claim, right? And then what they do is they actually go back and they do engage in open, uh, open responses and they do claim evidence and reasoning. We have some very new data with Hai Ying and I have been working on that actually has shown that up to 50% of, of children, their data from their log files doesn't match what they write because what students write is only a good metric of what they know if they're good at writing. So you have your math science geniuses, right, who aren't good at writing. So they're basically being tossed out on their ear. Or we say to teachers, what do you do? And they say, oh, I have to give them another assessment because I know the kid's brilliant, but they can't write. Okay? We can auto-detect that, or we can uh, detect that. Now we're going to auto-detect that. Similarly, what you have are students who are really good at kind of talking the talk, and they're hearing what people are saying, and they're writing something here, claim, evidence, reasoning but their data don't match. They actually haven't collected these data, and we can detect that as well, right? That's really important because that's, that's a big problem in science as well. This is our inch, you know, mile wide, inch deep kind of problem, right? So in our detector development, I'll tell you just briefly about this because this is when your eyes will really start to roll back in your head. Um, <laughs> So we started with two skills. We've done this for all the skills of interest now, but we started with two that we deemed the most difficult and the most complicated because starting at the easy um, part doesn't seem to make sense because you want to know if you're going to be able to finish such a task. So we started with testing hypotheses and designing controlled experiments because of their richness and complexity. And these are considered by some to be the linchpin skills of inquiry, right? And like I said, if your data is all confounded, you can't interpret it, right? So you really want to make sure that you can stop the, the student and react in, in real time. Um, so when we talk about design controlled experiments, though, it's not just CVS. It's the entire inquiry where they make a hypothesis and they collect the data for that hypothesis. So it's a contextualized set of data. So we uh, did this in the context of micro world, uh, the physical change, uh, physical, sorry, phase change micro world that I showed you. And uh, you can get more details in JLS 2013 or EDM in 2012. And so we collect the data, we build these text replay clips, we tag these for skills, right? And then you get inter-reader reliability between two humans, right? That's the first thing, right, that you do. And then you define the features using rapid minor, and then you build and validate the detector. So it's very complicated, and it uses methods that, like, we all use, right, inter-reader Integrator reliability, right? Everybody's comfortable with that. So if you think about these log files as protocol analysis for, um, it, if you think about this analysis as protocol analysis for log files, it's a, it's a way to think about it that, that is, uh, I think, a little bit more ingratiating because some people go, oh, log files, you know, that's like black box stuff. Um, it really is a very good window into what's going on. So what is the goodness of our auto-scoring techniques against hand-scored um, log files? So stating hypotheses, you have an A prime of 91. That's 91% 91 of the time we can detect if a student is uh, testing their stated hypothesis. That's pretty, pretty good, right? Um, other auto-scoring techniques are much lower than that, by the way. For designing controlled experiments, interestingly enough, which is more complex, our A prime is 94%. 94% of the time when the teacher said the student is designing controlled experiments, our system detects that. That's pretty amazing, right? 90, 94% of the time. So our detectors can auto-score 
testing state of hypotheses 91% of the time and design controlled experiments 94% of the time with high kappas, right? This is Cohen's kappa. So then we ask the question, well, how well does this transfer to a different domain like density, right? And this provides for another level of validation that the algorithm is capturing these skills that we're talking about, right? So interestingly enough, when we collected these data, um, our density environment wasn't fully built. And so students were still handwriting their hypotheses and then doing the experiment with the simulation. And then we were getting all the log files, right? So it wasn't nearly as guided as it had been in the state change environment. So we're thinking, well, we're, we're going to see, right? Will it lead to the same features? Because if it does, we can really sort of start to think about we're getting at these underlying constructs. So we applied the same exact same methodology. And um, we got 82% for designing controlled experiments. We couldn't do it for hypothesizing because remember, they wrote their hypotheses. We didn't, we didn't log their hypotheses in the same way. So this is very, very high, um, very high kappa. And we've uh, subsequently, A prime and kappa, we've subsequently improved that as well. This is using the same sets of features. So we can identify skill and density like uh, phase change. So someone might say, right, a domain general or, a, or a, a psychologist, for example, a cognitive scientist, in fact, I was the person who, who queried us about this first, said, well, they're both physical sciences domains. They're both linear. They both have one IV and one DV, right? Is that why we got this high degree of validity for our algorithms, right? That's a, that's a, a, a very tenable hypothesis. So, what we did was we said, well, what if we do this to a domain in which there's multiple IVs, the causal structure of the domain, and therefore the experimentation of the domain is very different. Like ecosystems, that's the most complicated micro world we deal with. It's got four IVs and four DVs, right? So it's much more complicated than a traditional linear one IV, one DV. And especially for designing controlled experiments, right? Because you can't just bury one thing because it's actually a system of big fish, little fish, uh, you know, krill and uh, seaweed that you're manipulating to get a stable environment, right? And these, these four independent variables are interacting. So it's very complicated. You can't just do pure CBS. So interestingly enough, that's an example of what our environment looks like. We got an A prime of 75. So 75% of the time, human scorers matched our algorithm, and we've subsequently made it better using the same sets of features. That's really impressive, right? So it tells us that we're getting at the underlying <coughs> construct of how a person is designing controlled experiments. Again, this is the beauty of machine learning. If you were to do this using knowledge engineering, it would be a much harder task, and you would have a very hard time assessing the validity of the algorithm in this context. So an overarching summary is that INCIT's design is based on a theory of human visual information processing, model-based learning, students' difficulties with inquiry, their misconceptions in domains, and evidence-centered design to address and support measurement of inquiry, scalability of this measurement, students' learning, the effects of scaffolding, which I'll tell you a little bit about, and teachers' practices, you know, vis-a-vis -vis alerts and reports. The assessment implications are that data mining and text replay tagging are used to develop these canonical models of what it means to demonstrate skill, and they handle the variability in students' experimentation, unlike knowledge engineering approaches, which is what's typically been done heretofore, right? And they can be too lenient or too stringent, right? So if, you, if you're in that situation, you're going to assess a number of students as knowing the skill when they don't, right? And that's a problem. This is the first use of data mining to evaluate data collection skills and student inquiry. And this has the potential to inform the design of future assessments. Now the benefits <coughs> are that you have automatic, rigorous, and scoring of inquiry processes that are more efficient than hand scoring, uh, works for tricky skills like control for 